I'm a cyclist and an athlete, and I've been doing you know, running and cycling events for a long time, and I, uh, and I ride a recumbent bike, which is a, a special kind of bike where you pedal out in front of you. And um, for fun, for a few years, I've been setting records on it. I cycled for 24 hours to, to see how, to see if I could set a new world record, and I did. My name is Jenny Mulligan. I'm married to Ray Mulligan. We've been married for 25 years, and we have five children. The oldest is 24, and the youngest just turned 14. I always admired Maria for her work ethic. She had a great relationship with my dad and my mom, and she was just diligent in every way. Jenny and I were always, always close and shared a room frequently and, um, and talked all the time. And <laughs> my family life has a lot of variety. Some days are extremely quiet because my children have gotten older and left home. And then some days are really um, full of everybody being around and joking and laughing and pushing and shoving and cracking jokes and um, eating food. And it's great. <laughs> There's too much going on right now. No, we have a great time yeah, together. We yeah. laugh and we're mothers and we home, Maria homeschooled yeah. for a long while there. I ask, Sometimes I get confused. <laughs> Sometimes I do too. You know, you reveal your, your insecurities and your weaknesses <laughs> yeah, to me and then that, oh, that allows me to reveal mine to you and mm -hmm. yeah, and there's so much. You know, and, and it's such a, if you go, <laughs> you know, if God calls you home, it's something that I'm so going to miss. Jenny was diagnosed on, a, I, I remember a, it being a Thursday that she went in for her MRI. I just had lost energy and I had headaches and, and I thought something's wrong with me. She called and that Thursday night and said, the doctor said there's something on the, um, something on the MRI. Well, you don't ever want to see something on an MRI of your head. And the MRI is when they found the really large brain tumor. He read the radiologist's report and he said, oh, Maria, this is really, really bad. And, uh, and he told me what it was. And, um, and I knew really how serious it was immediately. You have a very large brain tumor. And of course, that's affecting the way you feel physically and emotionally. And he said it was extremely serious and I needed to get into the brain surgeon as soon as I could. And I was just running around the house screaming. Just, just devastated immediately. I was like, okay, God has a plan and what else could you, you just have to do the next thing. My name is Jenny Mulligan, and on September 27th, 2012, I was diagnosed with brain cancer. I just thought I'll never ride a bike again. I just don't, I don't care about anything. I just wanna, you know, just be with Jenny as much as I can and try to help her. And, and um, <laughs> that didn't last very long because it just seemed like I should do something, and that's, and that's what I do, <laughs> I cycle. Whenever I would ride after Jenny was diagnosed and I would feel the anger and the grief, there was a sense that I was doing something good. We'd considered doing Race Across America the previous couple of years and just said no, it was too hard, too logistically difficult, just too much. And so we said, no, we're not going to do it. Uh, but then after Jenny was diagnosed, um, we revisited the idea of doing Race Across America because Race Across America um, is it's a famous ultra cycling race uh, and it's considered one of the most grueling uh, sporting events in the world. I could imagine cycling for 24 hours but it was hard for me to imagine cycling for 11 days. Please God, you feel better. <laughs> I am a fighter and I want people to fight. But uh, yeah, no, I wanted to win.
nervous, but I think an, an appropriate amount of nerves. I, I'll be glad when I get off the little ramp I gotta get off. <laughs> race Across America is a 3,000 mile race from, uh, a bicycle race, nonstop from California to Maryland. Starts in uh, San Diego, California and finishes in Annapolis, Maryland. You follow a certain course, it's 3,000 miles. Good luck. The gun goes off at the, at the start line, and, and the first person to Atlantic Ocean wins. Uh, you know, I'm feeling, you know, like all the eyes are dotted and the T's are crossed, and the team's been working really hard to get everything ready, and I, and I trust, I'm trusting. I had done a lot of planning for this since the very first day that we decided to do. Ram and then Maria decided to do Ram. I wanted to make sure that I was prepared for any situation. I was ready for if Maria needed a new wheel or if she wanted to change out her wheel sets, I was going to have that done and be, have the bike ready for her before she was ready to get on the bike. Our job as a crew is primarily to keep Maria safe, protect her, to see to it that she has plenty of food, plenty of uh, drinks. There's so many uh, little things to think about. You have to take care of the racer. You gotta take care of the bike, and you gotta take care of the crew. We'd been in Oceanside for three or four days already, so we were really rearing to go by the time of the start of the race. Of course, we were nervous, but I, I don't think nearly as nervous as my mom was. I was terrified. Passing through. The one with the visors. The, the dark, the, vis the, the dark night visor helmet. Let's go again. Let's let's knock out brain cancer. up to the starting line underneath the big Ram banner. The uh, MC asked me some questions. He asked me, you know, what my what my goal was. Well, all I can think of was like, I, I just got to get rolling here. And then uh, and then they said go, and, and off I went. As I was descending the glass elevator, I was just weeping with joy because it was so beautiful. And I thought, what a privilege to be here and to be, you know, the whole desert is, is, is out in front of you. And I'm racing along and, you know, I'm not pedaling. I'm just coasting at, you know, 30 miles an hour. And I, and I was just, I was trying to talk in my headphone. They couldn't hear me because the wind was so big. And it was just beautiful. And I was just filled with joy. down into the desert and it went, went well for a while. All the way through that night, it was great. Hope, I would define as the water that melts the granite, the water that melts the stone. Something that is inside of yourself but comes from a deeper place, a bigger place. here in the desert. Probably not as bad as chemotherapy, though, so if you're inspired, donate $10 to a <laughs> 3,000 miles to a cure. <laughs> I have um, an infusion of uh, a variety of drugs and chemotherapy that they're giving me. Um, and every two months, I have an MRI. What's been going fine. Um, I go every two weeks and I tend to feel good when I go in and not so good when I'm coming out. You know, I, 
it, it's okay. It just makes you feel bad. Please, God, you feel better. I would always remind myself this isn't as hard as what I had watched Jenny experience in chemotherapy, just the, just feeling so sick and, you know, she hates to throw up. And so I would think this isn't as bad as what she's doing or what she's been through. Yeah, I was ready to stop. It became just a slog. It was hot and I was sick and um, and I thought, okay, this is what it's all about. Miles and miles after that, you know. No, we're going into a time station, but I'll let you get to left-hand turn. Hope is that increment of belief and action that makes the insurmountable surmountable. When we finally got to Congress, which is the end of the desert, it was such a relief to get there. How was that last section of the race? Ooh. It was hard. Still probably not as hard as brain cancer and chemotherapy, but really hard. The Race Across America is not something that you can comprehend. The demands, uh, both physically and emotionally and psychologically, are uh, beyond us all. Many people who attempt the Race Across America, at least 50% who start out, don't finish. As they go through the desert, their dehydration causes their body to drop anywhere from 5 to 10% of its body weight. Having come from the, the desert of 120 degrees, we're now in the mountains uh, where it's uh, sometimes in the 30s um, and their body retains water, so they may gain 20 to 30 pounds in water weight. Okay. Then we descend into the hot, humid uh, Midwest, uh, Kansas prairie, winds, heat, um, dust. As we move more uh, into the uh, American East, uh, the quality of the road is compromised um, and it gets to be pretty dangerous. West Virginia has up and down uh, uh, spiky hills for about 100 miles. Um, just when you feel you, like you have uh, very little energy, uh, West Virginia puts you to the test. There's not a straight liquor road or a level liquor road in the entire state. Maria is going to need all the help that she can get. My name is Max Wallace, and I'm the CEO of a group called Accelerate Brain Cancer Cure. Many people ask me about the cause of brain cancer, and the sad fact is we don't really know. The worst part of a brain cancer patient's experience, to me, seems to be the fact that it attacks directly who you are as a person. It's just an overall sense of inability to do things that would have just been my everyday normal things. This has effects out all the way through the patient's family and relationships with friends. It, it's a particularly nasty disease because it really goes to the heart of who you are as a person and how you interact with people. My husband passed away in 2002, my kid's father, and um, people say, well, why are you, you know, why do you continue to do this? And it's sort of like if your um, mother I've been killed by a drunk driver, you fight drunk driving. Well, I'm going to fight against this, this disease until we find a cure. Aaron passed away a year ago on Memorial Day. And the better part of the past year, has, it's hard. it was hard not to be, you know, negative and mad and wonder if, you know, can you really heal from that? It's humbling to be weak, weaker physically and, you know, just be changed. Those of us who have experienced it never want it to happen to anybody else, so we're just determined to make sure that we can make a difference. Just never think something like that would affect you. And you know, that, that was a life-changing moment, of course.
cars for everybody. So in general, we're just trying to do a lot of the night stuff, get preparation for dark riding. So checking not getting her at all. Checking her tail lights, checking the van lights, all that good stuff. Here's the wheel. Alright, perfect. Every time we stop with Maria, um, there's there's kind of a routine that you check on the bike, make sure it's shifting properly, uh, making sure that the chain isn't overly dirty or have any kinks in it. I I was I, I didn't want to be that person that we're waiting for. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that throughout the race we were always waiting for Maria so that we could really go as fast as we could. I, I was almost 100% sure she was going to finish the race. I remember feeling really good because I was feeling well. I was I had real hunger for the first time in the day. Uh -oh. It was just one of those great moments. It was flat and the road was decent and I was feeling great. I just had to accelerate to get to you. Maria just, she's a fighter, so quit just isn't in her vocabulary. There was an accident. One person in the interior. Call nine one one. We need an ambulance. Careful, be really careful, guys. Yeah. What happened? I heard the sound and I figured that the van had been hit, and I saw stuff that was it was strewn all over the road. Ted, you got to tell me what happened. The car was hit. You know, is everybody okay? What you know, what's going on? Talk to me, Ted. Talk to me. Nothing. There was a flash. I saw the lights come back into my rearview mirror. I, I didn't have time to brace myself. I didn't have time to warn Dan or Will. Uh, it was just an instant impact. I remember spitting out something out of my mouth immediately after the wreck. Probably just glass from the, sh you know, shards of glass bouncing around the van. It was a terrible moment when I saw the back of the van. I, I just thought, ugh, that everything was gone. We'd spent months preparing that vehicle for this race. Uh, it was customized. We had taken out all the interior, rebuilt it, had shells built into it. It had our bike rack. It had our two spare bikes. It was full of spare wheels. All of those things were destroyed. We don't have any bikes anymore except for when I was riding. Yeah. I don't. I don't see how we can physically go on. Dan, Dan and I agree. I, I don't see how we can functionally one bike and one vehicle. You know. Okay, I'll let you know more about what's going to happen. Very, very disappointed, but everybody's okay. Let's just think about it. Why, why does that inside of the road with the glass around us, right? We've got lots of time. We've got racers. She's way ahead of some racers. There's other racers that are going to have. Someone went to the hospital. Lisa's been in the hospital now. It's over. Let's go back to the hotel. Well, we got to think about how we're all... Uh, how are we going to get back? Okay. We want to be safe going We can back do the... laps. We can do <laughs> I was, trips. I was thinking about the same thing. Yeah, well, the extra few inches. I'm so disappointed.
after we, we left the crash site, um, I just kept replaying the crash in my mind. We'd been up all night uh, trying to process it. I was glad to be alive. It was confusing. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what we were going to do. We had been so keyed up for months, and it was over. To see Maria go from this, I'm glad you guys are OK, to that sinking feeling that the race is over um, was unbearable. Even though I knew um, there was nothing I could do, I, I still sat there trying to convince myself of it. Everybody was really discouraged. There was definitely a sense that this is over and we got to wrap things up and, you know, send everybody on their way. And um, it was how you feel when, you know, you lose. The phone rang, and it was my nephew on the phone, and he said, just think about this. What if you guys just keep on going, just for the sake of raising money for brain cancer? And I remember thinking, if I can talk everybody into it, what a great idea. And I got a text message from Jim, and pretty much saying that uh, Jim, Maria, and Will wanted to sit down with me and have a talk. And the first thought that went through my mind was, great, the, the guilt that I'm feeling, they're realizing it. They're realizing that the accident was my fault. We wanted to do something to uh, at least try to keep the energy going to raise money to cure brain cancer. They kind of said, we're up against the wall right now. We've got one bike. We've got maybe a couple extra parts. Um, but we want to do this. We want to finish. We were trying to recover and try to make something out of basically a disaster. So we're going to sit down in the conference room, and everybody individually is going to decide what they're going to do. But I'm letting you know right now, if you're not in, nobody's in. We started RAM. The, the first couple of days were hard. They were rough. But our planning went well. I didn't really have time to think about whether or not I was going to do it. It just was a, well, if Marie is in, in I'm going to make sure she gets there. After the accident, I was thinking about the kind of telephone call that Jim would have to make. Um, if things hadn't worked out providentially so well for us, and I had no questions or doubts uh, about my decision at this point to withdraw from this event. We, we did have a couple people that were shook up to the point where they didn't either feel it was safe or didn't think they could handle it. We learned that Ram is not a safe race. I mean, we knew that coming in, but you don't almost really realize it until you see how safe it really is. Nobody really wanted to say we were done. Uh, we all wanted to have that hope that we could go, but nobody really could see how. You've been such an inspiration because, like, you're just, you're, you're putting your life aside to do something great and to, to impact other people's lives. So. <laughs> you <laughs> Last night I wanted to keep pedaling, I have to be honest. <laughs> I mean, after I knew that Will and everybody was okay, I want to get back on the bike and keep going. I want as many of you to feel like you want to participate as can and will, but I also completely understand now you know what you're getting into, basically. You know, it isn't going to be any easier, probably. When I realized that she really, really wanted to do it, when she was really desperate to keep going, I, you know, I got on board. Yeah, I mean, for me, at least, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but. I won't be fully happy unless we get some sort of closure. I think the, the atmosphere in the room really changed from one of defeat to one of hope. You know, I'm signed up through the 22nd, 23rd. I mean, the band's here. Uh, I'm, however you want to do it, I'll be in the band behind you. A 
lot of people that had that mentality of, well, if you're gonna go, I'm gonna go. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm still in. I definitely want to be part of it, uh, see it through uh, 100%. We want to do this. We want to finish. We're going to take you out and we're going to put you right on the road, right where the accident was, and you can start from that spot. We could do what we set out to do, which was give hope to people with brain cancer. Ted called Ram Headquarters, said, this is Ted Barnett. Maria Parker's back on course. We're starting back in the race, the scene where we stopped at the accident yesterday. And if you'll allow us, we'd like to get back in the race. But I think it was only really half an hour before I get a phone call again saying, all right, uh, we'd officially like to welcome you back to the race. Jim kind of talked to me while I was driving and said, would you feel comfortable being crew chief for the rest of the race? So I just destroyed the van, uh, took us out of the race, and now you want me in charge of everything? In my mind, I kind of assumed Jim was going to step in that crew chief role. So it was, it was exciting to be crew chief. Um, it was even more meaningful that they, that they realized that the accident wasn't my fault, there was nothing I could do, and that they had that trust in me uh, to get her to the finish. Everybody sort of looks forward to it in Dreads, Colorado, because it's, that's where a lot of climbing is. And um, so I remember when we crossed the border into Colorado, feeling excited to just get this done. Yeah, I had a great day. How do you feel about Two being days. officially back in the race? Was I'm excited. I, I was very surprised. I don't, I don't know if I can make up the time before I get to the Mississippi River, but I'm gonna try. Does that give you more motivation? Yeah, it does. It's nice to be able to think about maybe, you know, crossing the finish line, the official finish line. So uh, in 2004, my mom was diagnosed with a brain tumor. It starts off kind of, kind of normal and things are the same. You don't really know what it means. Uh, you don't really know kind of the impact the brain tumor will have. And then as, it carry forward, as you carry forward, uh, it kind of starts to progress in severity. I am Rachel Lozano, and I battled cancer when I was 15, and then I relapsed at 18 and 19. And all three times, it was very serious. Um, but I am happy to say I've had a total miracle, and I've been in remission for about nine years. For sure, I was given 40% chance. When I came back the second time, I was given 10%. And by the third time, I literally had 0% chance. Wow. So you were in the, you were in the, uh, you were not supposed to be here today. Yeah, I made a new statistic. Aaron was actually diagnosed with a brain tumor at the age of 25. We had, he had no symptoms, we had no idea. I've just learned, you know, just to slow down and appreciate, you know, today. Every day is its own challenge, right? And kind of confronting the, the day as best you can, regardless of what your situation is, whether you're having a great day or not so great day, right? Every day that you, you get to wake up, put your feet on the floor, you know, that's a win. We gotta, we gotta go forward in a new way. You, you can't just get stuck on the past, right? And this is the way things were. The reality is that they're not that way anymore, but you have to progress in, in a positive manner and embrace your situation, whether it's good or bad. How's Colorado treating you? Oh, 
good. My lungs, I've never had asthma, but my lungs just <coughs> seized up. <coughs> and, I mean, I live at 130 feet above sea level. Yeah. And that 9,000 foot stuff is for the birds. Yeah. It was just beautiful, you know. It was it was cornfields and a road, with two lanes. I mean, I, it's like this. I can do this, and and I just took off. Tell me all about your dreams. Oh. My uh, average speed went up, and and they'd tell me you're you're gaining on you know whoever the next rider was, and I started passing people. I was flying. I felt good. The asthma was better. We got some really good times in the flatlands. Show me your face. Side note. feel like the Hunger Games. <laughs> Hunger <laughs> yeah, Games too, right? Tracker. Yeah, this is sort of very Hunger Games-like, isn't it? It is. Except for, you don't have people trying to kill you out there. Well, exactly. yes, <laughs> yeah. I have all the cars and trucks in the world are trying to kill me. My name is Megan Samples. I'm currently in Morgantown, uh, West Virginia. When I was 17, my sister was diagnosed with a rare form of a, that presented in a rare way. Of cancer. Thankfully, she, you know, pulled through, and she has been in remission ever since. Um, she's now 20 years old, and she's beautiful. Um, she's doing really well. I'm quite hopeful that over the coming years, we're going to have a much better handle on where a brain tumor patient is in a course of the disease, and then where that disease is going, and that will give us a great advantage in figuring out how to better treat it. The way I think of hope is. It's kind of like when you're staring defeat in the face, uh, still envisioning success and still finding a way to, to find success. There's been a bit of a sea change that's occurred in brain cancer. And this is really a direct recognition of the fact that it is such an ugly and dire disease. I think when you're faced with these kind of trials, it's important to gather the people around you who can support you, to have that support system around you in place. Because without it, there's, there's no way that you're going to make it through. Traffic's all in the left lane, so take your time. I'm gonna try to hook back up with you. See if I get it hooked up. Oh yeah, it's all Okay, so how many can we have? We've got two climbs like that the same. Okay, okay, so two significant climbs. Yes, okay. big. Okay. Give a lot of something right here. Isn't that funny? Yeah. And right there, there's a hole in your helmet that's like yeah. <laughs> a ton through. I know I'm going to look not pretty for the award ceremony. <laughs> Everybody who starts Race Across America plans on finishing, but we all know the statistics are that only half of the people who start finish. I've done endurance events before, and I know that anything can happen. I mean, I've been on the bike for a long time. And I started to realize I still had a lot more uh, of the race to do, and uh, and that lack of sleep was starting to catch up with me, and I I took a tailspin. Hi, Hi this is uh, Team Four Six Two Maria Parker. We'll be down for at least half an hour for a nap. I think my mom was starting to feel the effects of sleep deprivation and exhaustion. And I think the crew is starting to feel that too. She's stopping for a little break. Uh, seems like pretty tired, pretty low spirits. Um, she's been cycling hard today, about 16 hours, I guess. Are two bands feel okay? Yeah, I mean, I'm not particularly sore. I'm just tired. Like in my bones, in my heart. <laughs> I just was. So discouraged and crying, and um, and the crew was trying to help me feel better, and so they showed me the book, and they showed me, you know, all the climbing and all the miles I had left, and that didn't help at all. I felt even more discouraged. Maria was just mentally done. 
I'm just tired, and, and my mileage is just not, I mean, it just seems like a look at it, and it's not moving. My name is Philip Seitz. I'm from Newburgh, Indiana. Hope is the only thing that keeps you driving, keeps you pushing forward. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys never lose hope, because once you do, you know, who's to say where you go from there? There's no cure for brain cancer. You're basically going to die. <laughs> We're all going to die, but we have brain cancer. There's no treatment for it. Uh, yeah, Aaron, out of nowhere, was, uh, I mean, we were golfing one summer, and then I think it was that October, so, uh, you know, stroke happened and whatever. Um, just unbelievable, you know? You know, initially when you're diagnosed with a terminal, well, with an incurable uh, illness, uh, where you know the outcome isn't good, you sort of wonder if there is any. I have brain cancer. Stage three brain cancer is anaplastic ependymoma, which is a tumor primarily found in pediatric cases, and uh, prognosis is not good. There's, it's baffling right now. It is outer space. You know, I mean, nobody knows what, what to do about it. It's just kind of like here we can do this and that. You know, throw, throw rocks at the moon, but we're not getting there. You know, so. I'm tired, and, and my mileage is just not. I mean, it just seems like a look at it. It's moving. Well, you, you don't have mileage anymore. There's no more miles. Because we're not going to worry about miles. You're going to go by your perceived effort. And we're just going to keep plugging along. All right? Everybody's got a day like this. And it's how we cope with that day and move on. So we're going to get through this day. <coughs> we're just going to keep pedaling. One foot in front of the other. Okay. If you want to stop every 10 minutes for a hug, I'll give you a hug. I didn't really have any choice, you know, just but to get back on the bike. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thanks. Love The last couple days of the race had some of the steepest hills of the whole cross-country uh, journey. The Appalachians were really hard. There was a lot of, a lot of long, steep climbs. These want some nice flats. What? Some nice flats. I don't like the downhill, I don't like the uphill. <laughs> and they, they just seemed to go on and on. I'd think, okay, I got this one done, and then there was another one. The mountains were really brutal. Um, we were all tired. My mom was tired. Carly posted on Facebook that I was discouraged and she asked for people to say things that were encouraging. And within 30 minutes of that, she started reading to me the things that people, <laughs> the things that people were writing was so encouraging. Lisa Baker says, home stretch Maria, the only way out is through. Larry Rockman says, Keep up the good work, Maria. You are an inspiration. You're all so amazed by your You are one of the strongest, most courageous, most selfless people. people from all I over the place, people who, are, who had been impacted by brain cancer and just other people who were inspired by what we were doing were writing these encouraging things, people from home, people from far away, long lost relatives. Rob Redford says, Jim Hall says, Megan Lynch says, keep on pedaling. My wife is battling glioblastoma. Your ride across America is encouraging us more than As she was reading them to me, I felt myself just sort of inflate. <laughs> you still amaze me. Sending you lots of love and strength this morning, my friend. Pedal on and keep the rubber side down. Luke Guevara says, you got this, Maria. You are an inspiration. I had life back in my legs, and I felt happy and encouraged, and I was reminded what I was doing, and it was incredible. There was definitely a point where I started focusing too much on the race, um, but when you start getting those letters and those personal stories of how much our racing means to the to everybody else, and uh, it, it's, it's a pretty magical moment. There are certainly days where this is frustrating, where you feel that we haven't made progress, or certainly not as much progress as we would like. But also, in working with the researchers, you see that they're gaining footholds in new areas and you want to help them. There are many, many researchers in universities and research institutions, but also in pharmaceutical companies that come together to, to bring these treatments forward. All of this takes money. 
And that's one of the things that we provide is we raise money from people who care about this to help fund the research, then goes through the doctors that then gets to the patients. We'd sort of gathered a bunch of groupies along the way. And so at the top of this, this climb, there was all these people just sort of celebrating with me. That was great. You know, I was thinking, okay, this is it. You know, it's just downhill from here, down into Annapolis. I remember going through Gettysburg at night and feeling sick and exhausted and just please let this be over, let this be over. Will was with me and, um, and, and he'd been with me all night. I was complaining to him and Will said, Mom, we're all tired, just get on the bike and let's finish this. And I remember at that moment thinking, yeah, this, I'm not the only one here. You know, everybody's tired, the whole crew's tired. worry about my future. Sometimes I, I wonder what the next de decision should be, you know, what next decision for treatment, next decision for my life, because I feel just more limited. So every day I try to make sure there's dinner. I don't even really go to the grocery store. People help me with that. But when I think about the future, sometimes I don't really know what to think of it. <laughs> I don't know how long it'll be. I don't know how I'll feel but I mostly don't park there because it's not very helpful. It's my birthday, that's right. Two. I have times that I get discouraged, but I try even in those times to say, wait, God's in control. I want to live trusting in Him. Let's go get him, let's, let's knock out brain cancer. Race Across America peels you back. Brain cancer peels you back. Every hard thing makes you realize that you're weak. But when you're weak, then people come to you and, and they help you and they lift you up. And then something really wonderful happens. Hope is an interesting word. It is based on the idea that there is a good future out there. And every day I really believe that there is, that the next day is coming and it'll be better than today, and that there is good stuff that we can all do. I'm a pretty hopeful person. I remember hoping that, that my ride and the attention that it garnered would create a desire for people to come alongside us and make a difference for brain cancer. I would say hope is the feeling that down the road, things are gonna get better. It's maybe more than a feeling, it's, it's a knowledge that things are gonna get better. There's never a point where there's no hope. There's always something that can be done. There's always that little bit more that we can give, uh, and there's that little bit more that we can do to make things better. There's gotta be hope out there because without it, we wouldn't strive to do better ourselves. You now is the time not just to hope, but to actually execute um, and you know to truly make a difference. And I really do believe the, the cure's on the horizon. And I don't know if that horizon is five years or 10 years, or maybe it's 20, but I know that, 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 that we're, we're, we're getting ready to broach um, what I think is gonna be you know, you know, a, a big time for brain tumors. I think there, there is absolutely hope. You know, I don't, I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the means, but by watching, you know, reading the news and watching some of the developments in the medical field is that now is as good of time as ever, in my opinion. We've come a long way with, with cancer in just the last 20 years. I mean, I talked to people that had cancer 20 years ago, and, and the things you hear that they were doing is unbelievable, and the survival rate was, was very few. A brain tumor diagnosis, it, it doesn't have to be a death sentence. You know, it's it's a journey in itself. It's hard, it's, you know, unfair, but it has definitely, definitely shaped me into a new person. How much longer? 1.6 miles. Oh, maybe soon enough. I do believe that there is going to be a cure. Um, when, I don't know. I think the most important thing is that people didn't give up hope on me and they believed in miracles too. 
when you're united for one purpose and with one um, like-mindedness, then there's a lot of hope that is derived just in that. Exactly. It, it gives you the hope when you stand around and say, meet the clinicians and the oncologists and the surgeons and the researchers and the big pharma companies, and you recognize they're all working together. You know, that's what it's going to take. No more silos. Just solving the problem. The fact of the matter is, is that hopelessness is a decision. Um, and every time we take a, a, a deep breath and, and breathe out again, we have another chance. How does it feel to be this close to the end? That was so sweet. Nothing was ever going to happen. If we could do what we did across the country and overcome the obstacles that we did and win, we can win the fight against brain cancer. I think hope is the lack of anxiety about the future. And, you know, we all deal with that on some level. I'm a lifetime boat person and have spent a lot of time out at anchor. And my favorite time is when it's absolutely black at 4.30 in the morning, and then you just start to see this little sliver of light come over the horizon, and it grows to become dawn and daylight. And I feel in many ways with brain cancer, we're right at that point. You're beginning to see the sliver on the horizon that a lot of the new work that we're doing is beginning to show signs that it will pay off. I'm, I'm pretty confident we're coming into daylight. gave me such encouragement to know that there were others out there watching, hoping, praying. Does that, does that give you? Yes. Yeah. Because in the darkest moments of Ram, in the darkest you know, times where I felt so discouraged, those were always immediately followed by some wonderful, beautiful, encouraging thing. And yes, that, that gave me a lot of hope. <laughs>